Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, let's, uh, let's talk. Let's talk. Can we talk? Let's talk. I'm a practical doctor. I do a lot of things which may not be perfectly defended by the literature, but you know what? I have to live in a political world. When Dr. Bucata said, uh, well, you know, the parents don't, uh, can't, they aren't very good historians. That's true, but you know what? It's their view of the situation. So when they mention something, I know whose expectations I have to meet. Now, I don't do stupid things, but how many people have heard this comment? Johnny can't keep anything down. Hands up. <laughs> what that means is you got to feed that sucker in the department. And as soon as Mama watches him keep a little something down for, for, for 20 minutes, you're home free. Now you're all right. But don't ever believe that you're taking care of the kid, because the kid's going to get better no matter what you do. I have three kids. I tried to kill them. I couldn't. <laughs> really, after 28 days, you can't kill those suckers. And I did everything. You know, they're big now. They're in their 30s now. And they're, you know, they're still coming home for money. Uh, it's a bitch. But let me tell you right now, I know who the patient is when they're in the department and it's mama. And it's mama and dad. And they're sitting, particularly in upper class, you know, taking care of poor people is real easy. You know, it really is. Uh, taking care of rich people is very hard. Because they've got lots of expectations. And they think because you haven't done a test, you haven't done something. And I'm an anti-test guy. I'm basically a health economist. Uh, I believe in nothing, okay? I'm a nihilist. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, I, I'm perfectly well aware of the fact that killing kids and, and, you know, and doing something to them is real hard. And that's the real danger in pediatrics because you, you see oceans of normal. And to pick out the one abnormal, the one that's really sick, is very hard. Actually, I'm in better shape in the emergency department because I see more sick people in a week than a lot of doctors in their offices see in a year. It's real easy when, when they come in real sick. It's that, it's that, I don't feel right. Or what's the matter? Well, you're the doctor, you tell me. <laughs> don't you love that? By the way, you and I, sh we should recognize something before we start this next talk. Each one of us has hot buttons and things which blind us to the truth. Whenever I pick a chart off that rack, if there are three charts on the rack, and one of them says four inch laceration on the inner thigh of a 17 year old cheerleader. The next one says allergic to Haldol and beaten up by the police. And the next one says terminal fibromyalgia. I know the order those damn charts are gonna come off the rack. And by the way, if I am working with a resident that day, I know which one is a staff case. <laughs> And which one is a resident case, okay? Uh, but, I, but I think that, you know, I understand the practical world. I live in the practical world. So we do certain things that are practicality. Um, but because I spend a lot of time in economics, and uh, I've been a visiting professor at Cambridge in England and that sort of thing, I've looked at various systems of making people well. Understand this, the largest industry of the United States is not cars, and it's not defense. When I was a kid, the defense budget of the United States was 50% of the federal revenues during the Eisenhower administration, 50%. Today it's about 22. You know what took its place? Healthcare. And it's killing us. Because we aren't smart enough to figure out that you know what, the end is the same. You know, you only live so many years and you're dead. I was actually teaching one time at the, uh, at the Queen's Square in London. Uh, which is sort of the home of neurology. <clears throat> and I presented a case, and of course, the British then have to quiz you. Mm -hmm. And one of their neurosurgeons, a Mr. Saunders, you know, the British call their surgeons Mr. <laughs> we should call our surgeons Mr. Okay. Uh, in any event, he says, Well, Dr. Henry, I suppose you tried to resuscitate that one too, didn't you? I said, Yes, Mr. Saunders, we did. He said, He died. I said, Yes. He says, Predictable. And then he waxed philosophical, which is what the British do because they haven't got any money. <laughs> he says, you know, when the great Viking chiefs would die, we would put them in ships, put them aflame to sea. Now when you try and die in America, 
We whip you with plastic lines and drugs. It's all ceremonial death. It's the society's way of saying ta-ta. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We were so stuffed with so much money for so long, we got into stupidity, i.e., the comment that he made, 24 out of 25 kids can be hydrated orally, hydrated orally, is absolutely right. I am slow to start an IV on kids. I am slow to do lab tests on kids. If the kid's hungry, I let him eat. You'll figure the whole thing out. And I think we need to start thinking about that if we're actually going to do any changes in the country. By the way, I have to do the, give this talk. I don't want to give this talk. But it has to do with something which is the biggest single problem in emergency medicine in these United States. In my other life, I write on risk management and um, I have the largest series in the United States of defending emergency physicians. I've done 2,000 cases. And clearly, the largest number of cases still has to do with chest pain. Why? Because it's a mysterious disease, isn't it? The last thing you want is somebody coming in like this. Now, family practitioners are not quite as bad as we are, but if you come into the emergency department and you're going like this, just a little bit like that. I don't care if you're visiting somebody. I don't care if you're the pizza delivery man. It's your ass, you're done now. Two lines, EKG, somebody's on top of you. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable and here's why. Here is the one concept that you must have before you talk about anything and that's what's good enough. What's good enough? What's close enough for government work? The British have defined this, okay? The Germans have defined this. Teaching the Germans is very interesting. I was speaking to a bunch of young Germans one time, and, and I used the term undocumented persons. Well, they speak perfect English, but they don't understand the language. As soon as I said undocumented persons, one young man says, Dr. Harry, what do you mean this undocumented persons? I said, you know, people who we don't know who they are. And they looked at each other funny. We know who you are, <laughs> and you will like it. <laughs> See, they don't understand this comment of, about people who kind of float around. Healthcare to them is an entirely different kind of question. You don't float around in Germany without somebody knowing what your blood pressure is. It's a very different kind of culture. U.S. healthcare is a very different sort of thing, and chest pain is where it all comes together. There are six million visits to emergency departments a year for chest pain, and triple that for family practitioners' offices. That's about what it is. And the, and the fact is, we don't talk about MI anymore as much as ACS, acute coronary syndrome. Because the truth of the matter is, if you're having an acute coronary event in front of me, even if it's not an MI, your chances of death in 12 months are exactly the same. It's about the same. If you're having real angina, whether you, whether you kill off cells or not, your chance of being dead in one year are about 10%, give or take. That's about what it is. Uh, and missed MI is still the largest. It constitutes 25 to 40% of the money lost in emergency medicine malpractice. This lecture will focus on three things, by the way. The utility of the EKG. This test which we get compulsively and never really look at, okay? Do an EKG, okay. Does it matter what it says? Not really. Well, let's talk about that. The utility of cardiac markers sending off blood and hoping a diagnosis falls out. And then we'll talk about these uh, combination of these things and some newer studies which are coming out. Do they mean anything? <clears throat> let's get back to this comment as how good is good enough? The lawyers would say our acceptable miss rate in MI is what? Zero. You're a scientist. You know that's crap. There is no such thing as a zero miss rate in something that has six million people. It can't be. Now, you and I will say, some of the older papers say, there's about 4% miss rate in the ED. That's probably about right what it used to be. <clears throat> that number's gone down considerably. But what is acceptable? And I only throw this out for discussion. If 0.5%, but let's, let's use 0.5%, that means we're going to admit 200 people to pick up one more MI. 200 people to pick up one more MI. But then again, if you see 1,000 chest pains, 
Most emergency departments here see a thousand chest pains a year. That ain't that much. That means you're sending home five people who, who, who have an MI. Is that an acceptable number? Well, <clears throat> we don't know what that number is, and, we, and until we do that sort of thing, it's going to be very hard to make any progress in health care in the United States. Almost everything that's talked about by politicians is a little crap around the edges about paying for things. But it's not about the service and what we're going to give out. I was the use advisor to Singapore on emergency medicine. They have better numbers, better male longevity, better female longevity, and lower infant mortality than the United States at 25%. They spend 25% what we do on health care. They've asked an entirely different set of questions. And I'll tell you what, it's going to be miserable. Question number two, what's the utility of the EKG? Because we always learn that history is most important, right? Is there any history in, in, in chest pain that rules out an MI, yes or no? No. Some people call it sharp pain. Some people call it dull pain. How many have seen the 60-year-old man who's 60? Shit, that's me. Uh, and, and I have coronary disease. Um, I had an emergent six-vessel bypass. And it ruined my whole day. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't have one moment's chest pain. I was running through the airport and got sort of funny jaw pain. And I said, you know, i got to stop chewing taffy. And then I said... I don't chew taffy. <laughs> Why does my face feel so funny? So I stopped at my own hospital, which is a huge mistake, of course. And then, of course, everybody's on top of you, throwing things into you, taking you to the cath lab and all that kind of stuff, pain in the butt. In any event, history doesn't do it, folks. It's so damn diffuse. And people didn't go to medical school. How many people learn to ask the question, does it feel like an elephant sitting on your chest? Raise your hand. You must have heard that question, right? Well, in my 33 years of doing this, I've only had one guy who actually had an elephant sit on his chest. Now, I worked in an inner city hospital, so I, knew, I had a lot of people who knew what stabbing chest pain was. They'd been stabbed. It was real easy. <laughs> but I had a professor at the University of Michigan of mechanical engineering. He's from India. And when he was a little boy, he was a mahout. A mahout is somebody who they team up with a baby elephant to raise, you know, because they use them there, they did in those days, for actual work. And the baby elephant rolled on him. I had to ask the question. I said, what's worse, the MI, which he was having, or the elephant sitting on your chest? Was it anything like it? And he says, oh, no, elephant, much worse. And, uh, and, and, and uh, so it was a very, uh, we, we learned to ask some of the stupidest questions. It's unbelievable. Um, <clears throat> article number one here. Uh, wonderful story. Uh, uh, the 30-day mortality is reflected by the EKG, folks. When you have just a mild t waves inversion, your 30-day mortality is 1.7%. When you had both uh, an elevated ST and a T-wave inversion, it went up to 6.6% in 30 days and 15% at six months. Yeah. The EKG does mean something. And the EKG, when it's positive, see, when it's negative, it's what? Worthless. It's not worthless, but what it is is indeterminate. That's what it is. That's what we should call it. <clears throat> it's indeterminate. But when it's positive, folks, that's huge. Going up from 1.7% uh, to 6.6% in 30 days, that's a huge number. Pay attention. New England Journal, Article 2, uh, predict, again, it predicts which patients are going to have inpatient complications. When they did the EKG in the department and they had nothing on it, they didn't have complications. Why is this important? Because we can't afford to build any more CCUs and staff with a 2 to 1 nursing ratio. We can't do it. So who are you going to put in the expensive bed and who are you going to put in the cheap bed? That's the discussion which is on the table. Low-risk EKGs, uh, Article 3 again. The difference between people who went on to have ACS, a diagnosis of ACS, low-risk EKGs, it was, four, it was between three and four times the difference uh, predicted by the EKG. 
If you had findings, it was four times as likely you were going to have narrow coronary arteries. I think that's impressive stuff. Bellwether paper in here, and this is how I like to do it. I'm going to point out, you aren't going to read this crap. I hated to read this crap, okay? You're not going to do it. What you want is me to do the work. You paid money. You paid money for two things, to come here and have us tell you what we think. And number two, you know, you run around at night. I mean, it's a great city, you know. Uh, um, gambling is, is legal. Uh, prostitution is legal outside the city limits. And, and uh, you know, have a great time. You know, this, this is your kind of city. Um, more medical meetings here than any other place in the United States. It's surpassed Orlando. You know, whoever Orlando has a, you know, a, a mouse and a, and a magic kingdom, you know, this, this place has real stuff. Uh, in any event, Article 6 is the one you circle. Because this is the one you want, and this is a classic article. This is Goldman's article from the New England Journal. And you know, all research is not created equal. I sit uh, as an advisor to six journals. I have to read that crap. And most of it is useless and a waste of time, and we don't know how to do our, a, a lot of research. This is real research. This is good stuff. Uh, most events, 62%, uh, when you see them in the ER, if they've got something bad happen, 62% of the time, you're going to get it in the next 24 hours. So that's what they do. It. By the way, I actually learned this when I was in England. My first time there, I was at Cambridge, at the, the Addenbrooke's Hospital. And as my host is showing me around, he points to a room and says, well, that's where the inferior MIs are. I said, oh, are they waiting to be admitted? He's a naive guy. He said, no, they're waiting to go home. He says, we give them 24 hours. If they're still alive, we let them go. <laughs> I said, you let them go? He says, yes. He says, they do about the same whether we put them in or let them go, so we let them go home. <laughs> Can you imagine doing that in the United States? Oh, my God. My God, 24 hours, and that was it. I learned a lot in England. Um, in any event, I, I think you should read Article 6, the rules. And by the way, there were things that said you're going to get into trouble. Uh, ST elevation or Q waves, low systolic blood pressure. Po if by history they had a, they'd had a previous infarct or a bypass, they had worsening angina or they had RALS, um, watch out. That group of people is going to do badly. These are people who are going to do poorly, and you need to think about it. Question three, how competent are we are reading the EKG? Well, the funny thing is, we've all become lazy as hell. How many people here have a computer system that, that prints out a reading on the EKG? Stick your hand up. Be honest. Yeah, what that means is if you take that away from you, most of you are screwed. And they looked at that. They, they, the American Journal of Medicine has the article 2005. This isn't old literature. 7, 8, and 9. All three articles talk about the same thing, and that is we're mediocre at reading it. Don't ignore the reading on the printout. And I've heard this in court a hundred times. Well, the machine overreads. You know what? Pay attention here. Because when the machine's kicked out, you know, uh, question old infarct, or uh, could be lateral ischemia, pay attention to that. And don't say, well, I don't know, this looks like a normal variant to me. You know what? As soon as that appears on the EKG, I'm concerned. As soon as that appears on there, I'm concerned. Because for one thing I know, even if there's nothing the matter with the patient, am I going to have to answer that someday if something goes wrong? Absolutely. Be aware that the machine is actually not so bad. It's better than you are in a lot of things. You know, we learned a lot of things as young doctors, which are basically a waste of time. How many people here still own a stethoscope? Yeah, I suppose you do, yeah. But understand, it's sort of doctor jewelry. Remember all the time we spent rolling people in various positions and listening to murmurs, and we said, well, I think that's a one over six, and there may be a 2% blow by back through the mitral valve. Well, shit, no, no cardiologist does that anymore. <laughs> they just, they do an echo and say, there it is. Here, the machine calculates the size of the valve and what the back flow is. Nobody do that crap anymore. Well, just understand, you know, the, the, machines, the machines are taking us over, and sometimes it's not so bad. All right, what about cardiac markers? <clears throat> what constitutes a positive troponin, and which troponin is the best? 
Well, I'll, let me, let me sh short circuit this discussion. The best troponin is I. T's are rarely being done. I, I mean, you're going to see those disappear off the face of the earth. It's troponin I. <clears throat> and, uh, but unfortunately, there are common causes for increased troponin that don't have anything to do with your heart. That's the bad news. The good news is, if the troponin is increased, pay attention. Because if it's up, say, well, it's not their heart, it's just their massive PE. Will a massive PE elevate their troponin? Yes, it will. Look at studies, <clears throat> or 12 is actually a very good study. Uh, it's a British study, but they have pericarditis. Well, what they had then was ST segments in all segments across the board at an elevated troponin. What it meant is if they had elevated troponins with their pericarditis, how were they going to do? Poorly. Elevated troponin in pericarditis is real. So when you see the troponin say, oh, well, they're not having a heart attack. That's right. They're having something else which is just a bad. What about if they have c congestive heart failure? You know, whenever you increase the left ventricular hypertrophy, whenever it goes up, the, the troponin also goes up. But it's a bad sign. People in failure who have elevated troponin, even if they're not having an MI, they've got a 10 times the risk of being dead at the end of this year. Pay attention to that. Last study in here is from McMaster's. Um, and uh, I'm going to pick out throughout this course a few institutions and a few people to talk about. McMaster's is located in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, any of you guys from Hamilton? No. Uh, it's a superb institution. Superb. Uh, the quality of the research coming out of McMaster's now is second to none. Uh, it's really become, I think, uh, Canada's, uh, one of its premier places of, of kicking out good literature, particularly with regard to PE, MI, that sort of stuff. Some very, very good stuff's out of there. Read the Article 15, which has to do with, again, uh, PE as, a, as uh, causes of elevated troponin. It's a beautifully done piece. Question five. What is the real value of a negative troponin? Does negative troponin mean anything? And the answer is, yes, it does. The question is, it's the timing of the study. Here's what we call a loser. Someone who's done one EKG and one troponin and said, you're not having heart disease. Go home. You then, we have another name for you then. We call you the defendant physician. And, and so it's a timing question on the troponin but it's not whether it has value because it has huge value. Let's just look at some of those. <clears throat> Number 16 is a German study. Th put three stars by that one. 30-day cardiac event rate, 1.1% if negative enzymes. And if, and if they have a series of negative troponins, eyes, 0.3%. Negative cardiac event rate, 0.3% if a negative series of zymes. Is that good enough? I think that is good enough, quite frankly. I think somewhere along the line, we got to say, what's, you know, when are we going to stop? How much are we going to do? When are we going to do it? Article 17, again, this is from Academic Emergency Medicine, one that I actually, I didn't edit this article, but I worked for them. If you have a normal EKG, and no cardiac history, you had, uh, and, and uh, you had normal uh, enzymes, the cardiac event rate was zero at 30 days. This is in 931 people. What does this defend? This defends us working people up as an outpatient. Uh, I think the, the Canadians are actually ahead of us on this one. I mean, you know, they... <laughs> People, you know, they, they've adjusted the fact that some people are going to die. Uh, and they're going to work up more people as outpatients. Why? Because Canadian hospitals are full and they're a mess. Any of you guys from Toronto? Yeah, you understand the problem. That the places are packed. They haven't reinvested in that infrastructure. They haven't rebuilt those hospitals. And they're doing whatever they can to keep people out. And so this is a very useful study. Now, again, if you add the EKG and the CPK, and the troponin, uh, you've, you've got now 30-day event rates, which are so small that the concept of sending them home, and by the way, we don't do this at my place. Pretty much, 
If you get your six hours in the department, something like that, if you're okay, they get what? They get stressed. If it's stress positive, they get a cath. If it's stress negative, then they go home. This data says we don't have to do that. We could set them up three or four days later to have the test done. And, and, the, and the negative event rate is incredibly small. Um, what about, uh, next question, question six. What about troponins in renal failure? Yeah, they do go up slightly, but if a renal failure patient has a one, a full one in troponin I, what are they telling you? They have a cardiac event as well. If a renal patient, don't sit there and say, oh, the troponin's only elevated because they're in renal failure. That's not true. In fact, they did a, there's a brilliant study done here where they took dialysis patients before and after dialysis, that sort of thing, and measured their troponins. No, their troponins aren't up. I mean, it's, it's minuscule. When they had the big troponin that would otherwise say cardiac damage, there was cardiac damage. You're looking at the same thing. What about alternative markers? Uh, there's something called ischemic modified albumin. Let me just cut this discussion short. Ischemic modified albumin is an interesting molecule which we're now looking at. It's not ready for prime time. Don't even think about ordering it at this point in time. It was no better, well, it's got a 75% sensitivity. What does that mean? I may be that sensitive after I've taken your history and looked at your EKG. What are you going to do with that number that's going to change what you're going to do to the patient? Nothing. What about, uh, the British have a wonderful study on this in here. Uh, that's uh, 23. Take a look at it. What about C-reactive protein? Let me make a comment. C-reactive protein is a test looking for a disease. Everybody, is there a disease where we haven't measured C-reactive protein yet? You see, the point is, does it go up with inflammation? Yes, it does. Does it tell me what I'm going to do with the patient more than any other of these enzymes? No, it does not. So if you want to have some other confirmatory test, order a C-reactive protein, I never do. Because it doesn't change what I'm going to do with the patient. Then they've got something called myeloperoxidase. Cleveland Clinic put this thing out. And I like the way the Cleveland Clinic did this. Cleveland Clinic, by the way, has a guy uh, there called Eric Topol. Eric Topol is a piss ass. He's an iconoclast. Uh, he's a very interesting thinker. He's the guy who pinned them down on the BIAC stuff. And Eric Topol is the guy who, with all of this, uh, uh, you know, we're going to treat heart failure with this and that and another thing, we're BNP and all this sort of stuff. Eric Topol said crap. And he's the guy who blew the whistle on that one, too. Uh, and then basically they said this myeloperoxidase did nothing to change what they were going to do with the patient. Don't, don't get to order this stuff. BNP we're going to talk about later. Understand this. <clears throat> uh, if you have, uh, question 11, what about, uh, what about these other combinations of markers? Uh, this has to do with, uh, and, and, and Article 27 I actually would read. Uh, it, this, this has to do with putting all of these markers together and deciding how your risk stratification has changed. Bottom line is this, if the troponin I is positive, if it has gone up during that time in the emergency department, your risk stratification has changed. And let me tell you how much it's changed. I think this is, this is maybe the most interesting data that we've presented here. Your 30-day risk, if your troponin has elevated, and you have a, and there's a positive change in your EKG, is 750 times what it is if you had a negative EKG and negative troponin. 750 times. I think that's big time. So when those things go up, pay attention. These are people who do need to be worked up. Article number 28 uh, is to me, this is the New England Journal article, 2003. This is what defends, this is the current literature which defends what we do with doing, the, doing negative EKGs, negative serial enzymes, and again, this is the Cleveland Clinic, this is Eric Topol. Uh, and uh, Topol says, outpatient stress testing 
done within 60 days is perfectly fine. They took, uh, you know, th there were several thousand patients. They asked this question, within the next two days, or the next 60 days, who's going to have a bad outcome if we do it that way? Two people they sent home, one had an MI and one dropped dead. Two people. Is that good enough? Well, we're going to have, see, the point is, we can't just go like this. There's got to be somebody answer that question, because we don't have infinite money. We can't admit everybody to the hospital, and I'm willing to bet, answer Canadians, can you bring everybody in and do a stress test that night? No, they'd kill you, wouldn't they? They'd hung you up by your thumbs and beat you. In England, they wouldn't even know what I was talking about. Okay? Of course, the other thing in England, they say, you know, well, a certain number of people will die. It's a very small country. It's a good thing, in many ways. Uh, clear, clearing out the riffraff. Um, in any event, Article 28 really is defends what we are doing, how we are going to do it, and I think Eric Topol needs to get a gold star for putting out this kind of research. Because basically what it says, yep, you've come in, three EKGs, three sets of zymes, it's six hours later, it looks okay, you're without symptoms, we can let you go home. And we'll, we'll get your stress test in the next 60 days. That's what they did in this study, and only two patients, one had an MI and one died, I think that's acceptable. And you know, I'm willing to go to court and defend you on that basis. And I think we have to stand up as a profession and say, you know what, where are we going to be at this point in time? This is what the testing is. These are our limitations at this point in time, and you can't do everybody. And we can do more from the emergency department. I mean, those of you who are family practice here, uh, you understand the situation because you see a lot of these people in your office. Who's going to come in? Who are you going to send to the hospital? I think, this is a, I think this is a bellwether, not just of how difficult science is, but it's a bellwether of what we are going to do with our money. It's a very, very interesting process. By the way, I'm one of those guys who believes that catching hypertension at age 30, treating it aggressively, is more valuable than every coronary care unit in the United States. Finding blood sugars which are elevated and treating them, height to weight ratios, body mass ratios, uh, blood sugars, blood pressure, those are the numbers which actually make a difference in the long run. And other countries are ahead of us in thinking about it in this way. All right, uh, my time is up.